Welcome back. In the previous video, we introduced the concept of control volume analysis. We introduced the idea of a control volume and how it is used uh, to calculate the conservation of mass as a flow passes through it. Now, we did this rather uh, by example, and we haven't really formalized uh, this idea very much. So this is the purpose of this video. We're going to formalize the ideas of the previous video and introduce the concept of the Reynolds transport theorem. So as we saw in the previous video, control volume analysis requires the identification of inlets and outlets. As we saw, for the conservation of mass in a control volume, the time rate of change of the mass inside the control volume is a balance between uh, the amount coming in and the amount coming out. So knowledge of the inlets and outlets is of utmost importance. Now, what about weird geometries? Or what about flows that are not aligned with the inlet and the outlet? Okay, so here uh, in in this little schematic here, we have a surface here, could be an inlet, could be an outlet. Here I have it as an, uh, this would be an inlet. And we see that we have a flow with a velocity and it's at an angle to, uh, to the inlet. So we define the inlet as having a unit outward normal. So you would have seen this before. So this is a unit vector. So it has length of one and it is normal to, uh, to the local geometry of the inlet. So how do we deal with something like this? Now, what we can do is that we can consider the dot product of the local velocity vector and the unit outward vector. So recall that the dot product will tell us that V dotted with N is the dot product. Dot product. Now let's think about this. For the case shown on the left, we have a flow entering the control volume. This is an inlet. So in this case, the dot product will be less than zero. Okay. So the velocity vector and the unit outward normal are pointing in opposite directions. Okay. Now, why is that negative? Now, I, I should hope that you remember from high school, perhaps, that the dot product of two vectors, so let's say we have a vector A dotted with B, so the dot product of A dotted with B would tell us that it is equal to A multiplied by b, so the length of a multiplied by the length of b multiplied by cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. So here we can see that um, our two vectors, so in, in this case we have the unit outward normal like this, and you have to connect their tails, as you remember from high school over here, so this is your theta, so we will get a negative number, okay? So V dotted with N is less than zero for an inlet and the converse for an outlet will tell us that V dotted with N is greater than zero at outlets, okay? Now I'm going to write out uh, what we derived in the previous video for the control volume analysis um, or the control volume form of uh, conservation of mass. So we saw that we have zero is equal to the time rate of change of the mass in the CV minus, here we have the mass flow rate in and 
the mass flow rate out. So this is what we saw in the previous video. So again, this is the, I'm going to call this the accumulation, accumulation of mass in the CV. And I'm using the word accumulation rather loosely. You should not only think that it means that it is increasing in time, but it could also be decreasing with time. And this is the mass flow rate in and the mass flow rate out. So as you can see, just rearranging, we would see that the accumulation of mass in the CV is equal to the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out, which makes intuitive sense. So now using our dot product notation, we can express continuity or conservation of mass as follows. So we would say zero is equal to the time rate of change of the mass in the CV and so we just have a much more compact form. And this is what this says here. This is a closed surface um, integral. So it's a surface integral. And this is the notation. So what we're saying is that we're integrating over the entire surface of the control volume. Now, obviously, if there is no flow going in and out of a certain surface, such as a wall or whatever, then, well, that portion of the integral is zero. Okay, but what we have here is the density multiplied by the dot product of the velocity multiplied by the unit outward normal, as we saw at the beginning of the video. And so this form here of the control, uh, cons conservation of mass is equivalent to this form here. Okay, it's a more compact notation, and it allows us to consider um, a bit more complex flow situations, such as when the velocity vector is not aligned with the inlet or outlet. So what this says, this V dotted with N, is the projection of the velocity in the direction of the inlet or the outlet. So in this case, over here, in this schematic, it is really only the component of the velocity in this direction. So it's only this one over here that actually enters um, the control surface or the control volume. Okay, This tangential component over here is inconsequential. And this is what the dot product does. It projects the velocity vector v in the unit outward normal direction. So this is a compact form, and this one is good to know. Now, again, all of this was kind of done by um, sort of by example, right? It hasn't really been formalized. So we're going to formalize this with uh, the introduction of what is known as the Reynolds transport theorem. Okay, so now we turn our attention to the Reynolds transport theorem, which will help us formalize the ideas previously presented. So this generalizes the control volume procedure for other conservation laws. Now, I'm not going to go through, der through the derivation of the Reynolds transport theorem, but it is available in most textbooks if you're interested uh, in knowing where it comes from. Okay, so. The starting point is identifying some property that we are interested in. Okay, so again, Reynolds transport theorem is for conservation laws. So we have conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, which is, um, you know, fundamental to things like Newton's second law, we have conservation of mass, etc. So these are the properties that we're talking about. So capital B or uppercase B, is a total amount of some property in the system. The lowercase b, 
is that same property, but per unit mass. So I gave a few examples here. So if we're looking at momentum, we know that momentum is the product of the mass times the velocity. So our uppercase B will be MV, and our lowercase B will just be that same property per unit mass. So we're dividing it by the mass. So that's just, we're just left with V. Uh, similarly, the kinetic energy, one half MV squared, if we're expressing it uh, per unit mass, we're just dividing by mass, so we have one half V squared, okay? So, this is a really, really powerful theorem, and uh, hopefully you'll see why that is uh, very soon. So, the amount of the property in a CV at some instant is given by um, the integral that we have seen before. So the integration of rho b dv, uh, which, you know, you can see that rho is your, uh, your density. So in SI will be kilograms per meter cubed. And then b is um, your, your property, which is B over M. And so this will be actually in units, we would express this as B per kilogram. And then we have DV, which has um, units of meters cubed. Okay, so as we can see here, um, what we are left with is so we're just left with uh, B, which is what we're looking for, essentially, right? So the amount in um, the control volume at any given time. All right. So with that said, um, you know, we can also integrate this um, the property per unit mass, and then we're going to multiply that over all the differential masses in the control volume. Okay, so the Reynolds transport theorem, Reynolds transport theorem gives us the following. It says that the time rate of change of our property B is equal to the time rate of change of that same property per unit mass in the control volume plus the surface integral of the density multiplied by the property B per unit mass multiplied by V dotted with N ds. Okay, so this is Reynolds transport theorem. And I will take a few minutes to explain what every term means. Okay, so it should really be emphasized here what the Reynolds transport theorem is doing. The left hand side, so this side over here, is the time rate of change of the property in a system. So recall, we differentiated <coughs> the idea of a system and a control volume. So a system is an identifiable amount of mass. Okay, so imagine that we're tracking a group of particles as they move through space. Okay, so that is one frame of reference, okay? So it is the time rate of change of the property of that specific blob of matter. And this is known as a material material derivative. For all intents and purposes, for the time being, it's just like a normal derivative. Okay. So it tracks the change of that property, uppercase B, throughout the motion of the system. The right-hand side, on the other hand, tracks the rate of change of that property 
but within the CV, within the control volume. Okay, so this is, so again, I'm just going to emphasize this. This is uh, tracks material. And the right hand side is um, what's happening uh, in, in the control volume. Okay, so two different frames of reference. So it tracks the rate of change of the property within the control volume analysis, uh, within the control volume. And so this is the time rate of change um, of the property B within the control volume. And this second term over here accounts for the inflows, outflows. And this is the time change within CV. Okay. Thus, what the Reynolds transport theorem is in effect doing, it is tying together two different perspectives of observation of a flow. One which tracks a moving particle or set of particles, and the other which simply observes the flow through a volume. And this is a very powerful result because the equations of motion that we know, Newton's second law, conservation of mass, etc., they apply to a specific body or a particle or groups of particles. That is the left-hand side of what we see here on the Reynolds transport theorem. Okay? So we're going to look at a few examples of the application of the Reynolds transport theorem. Okay, so first we're going to look at conservation of mass. We saw it before, but now we're going to see how Reynolds transport theorem will yield the same result that we found through our thought experiment. Okay, so for conservation of mass, you know, we have a system, a particle, a group of particles. <clears throat> so uppercase B, the property that we are um, interested in would be the mass. Okay, so let's just consider uh, a group of particles. They will have a total mass m. Okay, so as we introduced, um, we need to consider that same property per unit mass. So we're essentially just dividing by mass. So for conservation of mass, lowercase b will just be the mass divided by the mass, which is just 1. Okay. So now we turn our attention to the definition of the Reynolds tra transport theorem. Now again, our conservation laws, they apply to specific particles or groups of particles. They don't apply to volumes of space, which is essentially what a control volume is. So conservation of mass for a particle, it would make sense that the time rate of change of our property, which in this case, it would be dm by dt, it should be equal to zero. And this is just by definition, right? You can neither create nor destroy mass. So hopefully this, this makes sense, right? So if we're tracking even just, let's say, one particle going through a control volume, that particle will not increase in mass or decrease in mass. So this would suggest that the left-hand side of Reynolds transport theorem should be equal to zero. Now the right-hand side will be equal to the time rate of change of the integral of the density. Now we're going to multiply it by, so as you can see over here, we have the uh, lowercase b, which in this case is just one. Um, and then we multiply it by dv. So this is just the time rate of change of the mass in the control volume because the product of the density and the volume is the mass. So the time rate of change of the mass in the control volume plus the surface integral of the density multiplied by lowercase b, which in this case is 1 for, con for mass, multiplied by v dotted with n. So the projection of the velocity uh, 
onto the unit um, outward normal multiplied by the differential area ds. And this is exactly what we saw earlier on. Conservation of mass in control volume form. Okay, so the time rate of change of the mass is equal to the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out. And this is what this is saying. Okay, so, um, and again, right, we can, we can see this because this V dotted with N is going to be positive for an outlet, uh, negative for an inlet. If you just rearrange the equation, then the time rate of change of the mass is equal to the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out. All right, we now turn our attention to another conservation law that is particularly important in fluid mechanics, and that is the conservation of momentum. So momentum is the product of the mass times the velocity vector. So momentum is a vector in and of itself as well. So for use in Reynolds transport theorem, we're also interested in lowercase b, which is the property per unit mass. So in this case, the momentum per unit mass is just the velocity vector v. All right, so we're going to turn our attention to how this is going to apply to Reynolds transport theorem. On the left-hand side, we have the time rate of change of the property uppercase b. So in this case, this is the time rate of change, and perhaps just for... Um, consistency, I should put this as an uppercase D. And again, this is just, um, it's just a notation to specify that this is what we call a material derivative. But again, I just want to state that this is just like a normal derivative. Okay. Uh, so it's a time rate of change of the momentum. Now, I would encourage you to take a pause here and think, what is the time rate of change of the momentum? So, Newton's second law states that the time rate of change of the momentum is equal to the sum of the forces. So the sum of the forces is equal to the time rate of change d by dt of mv, which is also equal to db by dt, our left-hand side. So we can actually replace the left-hand side of Reynolds transport theorem by the sum of the forces. And this will be the sum of the forces acting on the system, whatever that might be. All right, so when we're looking at conservation of momentum, when we're looking at d by dt of the momentum vector, that is equal, as we know from Newton's second law, to the sum of the forces. So that's second law. All right. So we can put on the left-hand side, uh, the sum of the forces will be equal to the time rate of change within the CV of the density multiplied by our property per unit mass. In this case, it's the velocity multiplied by the differential volume plus the surface integral of the density multiplied again by lowercase b, which in this case is the velocity multiplied by the dot product of velocity and the unit outward normal, ds. Now, probably for most students who have not seen this before, you're probably feeling a bit overwhelmed and that's okay. This is actually going to become much clearer once we start looking at some examples. Okay. So essentially what this is saying is that the sum of the forces is equal to the time rate of change of the momentum within the control volume plus 
the momentum, we call this a momentum flux. So the amount of momentum being transported into and out of the control volume. Now the left hand side of this conservation of momentum in control volume form requires perhaps a bit of discussion. So what are the forces that a fluid might encounter? And recall, this is the forces that are causing a change in a momentum of a fluid. So we could have pressure forces, right, pressure force. So we know that these exist in fluids, of course. And so a pressure is a normal stress acting on an area. And again, these are very mathematical um, descriptions of the pressure. But um, once we start looking at examples, they will take much simpler forms. But we know that the pressure acts against uh, a certain surface or an area, right? So it's always acting inwards. So this is why we have a negative sign over here, okay? So it's acting in the negative direction of the unit outward normal. So the unit outward normal is always pointing outward, outward from the surface. And so the pressure is pointing inward towards the surface. And this is why we have the negative here. And so a pressure is a force per unit area. So then we're multiplying it by ds, which results um, in uh, dimensions of force. We have viscous shear forces. And so we don't look too much into this uh, in our introductory fluid mechanics, but we know that between layers of fluid um, or between a fluid and a wall, you're going to have viscous shear. So due to the action of viscosity, there's going to be a force in the tangential direction. Okay, And mathematically, what we state is that the viscous shear force is equal to the integral of the viscosity multiplied by the gradient of the velocity And this is the velocity in the tangential direction, okay? And this is the gradient normal to the surface. And this is why we're saying uh, the derivative uh, with, re with respect to the n direction, okay? Now, again, the details of this are not important at this point, okay? We could also have body forces um, such as gravity, okay? So, for example, the gravitational force will be equal to um, the mass times uh, the gravitational acceleration. Okay, so mass is uh, rho dv, and then we're multiplying it by the gravitational acceleration. Okay, so these are the types of forces that we might encounter um, in control volume analysis. All right, so let's recap what we've done. We formalized, um, so, we looked at control volume analysis in a previous video through a thought experiment. What we looked to do is um, formalize a few concepts. So one of them is that we saw that the inflows and outflows in and out of a control volume are, are very important in control volume analysis. Now, we asked the question, well, what if we have weird geometries or perhaps the inflow velocity or outflow velocity is not necessarily aligned with 
uh, the surface that defines the inlet or the outlet. Okay, so we formalize this idea by introducing the dot product of the velocity and the unit outward normal. Then we introduced Reynolds transport theorem, which links two observational vantage points for fluid mechanics. So one of them is one that tracks a material a, that could be a particle or a set of particles. And the other vantage point is our um, control volume perspective, where we're just observing a volume in space as fluid flows through it. So we are not following individual or groups of particles. We're just looking at a fixed area or a fixed volume, and we're just seeing um, um, a fluid flow through it. We then applied Reynolds transport theorem to uh, two of the conservation laws that we are particularly interested in introductory fluid mechanics, and that is conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. Now, in the following videos, we're going to look at examples of how to apply these concepts.